a few seconds. And it is 7 o'clock. This is Charlie Stern. Uh, this is Red Blue Talk. My channel is all about how politics and government impact people's lives. And I'm trying to reboot this show right now by having more guests on more frequently. And let's just get right into it. Uh, welcome to Damon Marr. Welcome, Damon, to Red Blue Talk. Charlie, it's great to be here with you. So Damon is a, a member of the Westchester County Board of Legislators. You've been on there since 2017. Uh, I guess this is now your second term. There are two-year terms on the board? Correct. you got 17 uh, members. You have 16 colleagues. And, uh, and I guess now you're, uh, you're not a freshman anymore. Um, I, there's so much I want to talk with you. I appreciate you coming on the program. But you know, give us a little bit of background about you know, your experience on the County Board of Legislators. What, what brought you to that experience? Well, well, you know, uh, so three years ago, I was uh, 61 years old. I'd never run for uh, any public office before. I'd been on the library board, which we have an election for here, but, but you know, not um, the serious big time elections. And I was always one of the ones working as a Democratic district leader for a number of years, trying to recruit people mm -hmm. to, to, to run and, and uh, a particular um, seat that's this district, which is most in Rochelle, and it's all of East Chester and Tuckahoe, um, had been held by a, a very conservative Republican uh, for quite a while and put up all sorts of candidates to try to, to beat her. And what was her name? Uh, Sheila Marcotte. Okay. Long time uh, hard worker, but just working hard on the wrong things from my, from my point of view. Um, very closely aligned with Rob Astorino, the, the county executive at that time. Um, and so 2017 came around and, and I was, you know, working, trying to recruit all sorts of, you know, people who had better name recognition than I did and better source of funding and, um, knew more, you know, just better, you know, known better and, and, you know, better, honestly, speaking presence and all that sort of stuff. And that wasn't happening. And meanwhile, I was getting pretty, uh, upset about a couple of issues specifically, um, the gun show in Westchester County Center. Uh, I found that very offensive that, that, that they brought back that show, you know, with, with thousands and thousands of guns uh, being displayed and, and sold in uh, one of the, what's supposed to be one of the wholesome venues for families there, um, you know, circus and, and the reptile show and the Harlem Globetrotters and that sort of thing. Um, under the the umbrella of the county parks department, and I think it just didn't fit the mission. And um, and Sheila was a very strong supporter, you know, Second Amendment, trumping everything. And by the way, Trump is a good word too, because she, you know, she was a Trump supporter um, in the year after the the Trump election. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, I guess I pulled at Dick Cheney and said, looked around and said, well, I guess, I guess I'm the guy, uh, we need and, um, went in with a great deal of trepidation because I was, you know, not particularly skilled at public speaking and basically kind of shy nature, but I went out and, you know, knocked on 8,800 doors over the course of, when did I start, you know, about six months, you know, mm -hmm. starting a little before, um, Memorial day mm -hmm. and, um, you know, got known for that. So I got, I got uh, a lot of good support within the regular Democratic Party and then the Indivisible Movement, which was blossoming at that time in reaction to the um, Trump election. Right. And I have to honestly say, you know, I think I'm pretty good, but, you know, 99%, not 90 95% of the reason I won was because we, we had this great blue wave uh, in reaction to the, the Trump election mm -hmm. the year before. And there's been a wave of people. Uh, it, it, that's why it's a wave, right? Because you're not the only one. There are a whole bunch of people uh, at, at every level, um, from school board to city councils to Congress to county boards of legislature and, and state legislature people um, that came along in that 2017 wave. I, I want to double click on on that. You said that you know you'd been active as a Democrat before, as a Democratic district leader, and you ran for. Um, library trustee but there was something different going on in 2017 and there was a, a rising progressive movement you alluded to indivisible 
So t tell me a little bit more, like, what does that mean? What is it? You know, I always thought I was progressive, but I never thought of it as a movement. And what does it mean to be progressive? Well, first of all, the, the indivisible movement, um, to, to a great extent, arose as a, a reaction just to the whole Trump uh, persona. You know, not necessarily just his ideology, because the Repub I, I look at Trump as the logical outcome of the Republican ideology since, you know, Nixon, Reagan. Um, and they were you know, extremely offended by him, but mostly women um, who prior to that year, probably a lot of them wouldn't have a hard time naming who their county legislator was or even state assembly person or, or state senator. And um, all very smart people who got up to speed very quickly mm -hmm. and hard workers uh, who helped me immensely in, in many ways. Um, and, and progressivism, uh, you know, it says that there are things government can do better than uh, business. You know, most of us are still capitalists you know i i my day job is a, an attorney that that sues uh you know representing businesses that sue other businesses because they don't for breach of contract i mm -hmm. mean it can't be any more capitalist than that mm -hmm. but we see that there's a role uh for government in overcoming certain inequities that that uh, excesses um that have arisen in this system mm -hmm. and i think that's that's really the, the more general way of putting it that that um you know we think government can be used for good in some areas to to make people's lives better and and bring a more just and equitable society that we all want to live in so tell me about that gap between the that you you referred earlier to I, I don't remember your exact words conventional the democratic party versus indivisible what's what's that all about in westchester how how, how does that how does that play out i think it's sort of been a you know a jolt of, of uh, you know, energy, you know, fresh air. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's sort of a winning attitude, too. I mean, you, you know, we had for so long, Democrats in Westchester County had had have had, you know, more than two to one advantage uh, over Republicans in registrations. And yet right. we didn't control the county legislature. We, we had, you know, we didn't control the uh, county executive's office for, for eight years mm -hmm. um, in my own district. It, it's, uh, you know, most, most you know, in national elections and even state elections, it's, it's a Democratic uh, district. But Democrats were just not getting out in the odd numbered years for, for these uh, local elections. So now it's um, 2020 and, and, and they are, but they now they are, right? So now you've got, you've got a, a, a county um executive who is a democrat there was a republican he's now a democrat you have 17 seats uh, 16 out of 17 seats on the county board of legislators are uh occupied by democrats and then the question becomes well the other one is, is registered conservative so zero republicans on on a 17 member west county board i mean that's you know charlie you were telling me you, you grew up in westchester i mean that if you'd said that 20 years ago or when I was a kid 50 years ago or 40 years ago, whatever, when, when you know, re Republicans dominated uh, to a large extent, that's when, you know, Republicans, there were, you know, Rockefeller type Republicans and, mm -hmm. you know, Javits Republicans, uh, kind of a, a, a uh, missing breed now. Um, and, so uh, it's kind of an extraordinary time. It is extraordinary. Do you think that that uh, that pendulum could swing back without Trump? Do I think it's, uh, so my my only concern was is uh, if we if we win the presidential election that um, you know we, we get overconfident and we we stop thinking about local issues and and um, local elections but it's hard to see it going back in that direction I see people you know very committed um, again, to the progressive values. I mean, you know, part of it now is pushing, you know, some of our Democratic brethren um, 
to do some of the things locally that we say, you know, mm -hmm. very strongly we believe in as a general matter and, and um, you know, on a national basis. So I don't want to make um, too much of that. But, the time is but is that Excuse perhaps, me? I don't want to, I don't want to oversteer on this question, but is it possible that there could yeah. be somewhat of a, um, a, a, a cleavage within the Democratic Party if it becomes like a one party county? And is that are we are we seeing early signs of that uh, in the you know five twelve votes that we've seen on the board of legislators? I think uh, primaries might be, start becoming more important than the general elections, like as is true in New York City, for example. You win the Democratic primary in most places in New York City, and that's it. That's the election. And, you know, we've already had it. I mean, we've had it uh, in this past primary in June. We, we had, uh, a, 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 you know, the DA incumbent, very nice man, uh, knocked off by uh, a person who was supported by the Indivisibles and, and, by, and, and by like a very large margin, two to one. Right. Yep. Uh, we talked earlier, you know, before we were on about uh, Jamal Bowman uh, being, you know, stalwart uh, Congressman uh, Elliot Engel. Mm -hmm. And my friend Mondaire Jones, uh, just north of here for that, that congressional mm -hmm. seat. I, I think he was the best progressive candidate in that race. And the people, you know, there, there, there were other candidates. Remember, that was one with seven or eight candidates. Yeah. And we thought maybe somebody would get 18 percent of the vote and win. But he got like 45 percent of the vote. And, won. and some of the candidates who were more traditional had endorsements of, the you know, party committees and unions and that sort of thing didn't didn't do as well so let me ask you a question um, so, since you, know, you that's, since, that's you, since you brought up those names um and you're clearly you're following these things really closely did you think that jamal bowman would win i was surprised i was surprised um because you know elliot's you know very good man um i you know i i, I supported him i'm very you know uh loyal because he he's helped me um, in the couple times I've run, um, you know, his record is progressive. Uh, you know, I, he had uh, a, a very unfortunate uh, hot mic thing toward the end, which was taken out of context, you know, kind of, I thought kind of unfairly, but, you know, that's politics, apparently. Um, yeah. You know, and, and people, and, and if you just look at, you know, the, the, the ages of people too. That's that's and you know if ethnically, um, Bowman may also more closely reflect the the district as a whole. Because remember, it's it's mostly in the Bronx. We think of it as, you know, uh, our district because the district comes up here to New Rochelle. Um, but you know, it's 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 a uh, good good part of the Bronx and um, Mount Vernon as well, and some of Yonkers, I believe. Um, so you know, I guess. We shouldn't be as surprised as, as we are. So my two cents here, um, I was not surprised. It may not make me popular to say this, but I'm not running, so I can mm -hmm. say it. Uh, I was not surprised that Jamal Bowman was successful in that race. I was surprised that it took so long for his success to get into second and third gear. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the hot mic. Um, we are operating. Uh, my my view my view of this was that we were operating in such a charged environment that mm -hmm. a long term incumbent had a significant liability that it is possible to overcome. But I didn't see the angle people doing anything to modernize their approach to campaigning. They were basically running the same primary campaign that they ran two and four and six and eight years ago and probably further back when I wasn't paying attention as closely. So um, I felt that uh, it, it, it was like when that hot mic thing happened, I was like, okay, it's all going to start to happen now. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the Bernie Sanders attention, the Bernie Sanders energy, the Elizabeth Warren energy, uh, the uh, Ocasio-Cortez energy, is now going to form like a vortex and this guy's going to win that's kind of how i viewed it um, well we you know and we had black lives matters um that whole movement as well and right 
and nobody, you know, and seasoned politicians not knowing how to run without having a ground game, you know, couldn't go out and knock on people's doors. Right. Uh, couldn't go to, you know, a lot of events. Well, uh, let me give you one example of that's very practical about what you're talking about there, Damon. Um, Mimi Roca had yeah. between 250 and 300,000 followers on Twitter. Mm -hmm. her, her opponent, her opponent, I, I, I don't think he was even in the double digits. I don't think he had a hundred followers. So, you know, and I'm not saying that, you know, your, your value as a human or as a public servant is linked to the number of um, followers you have on Twitter, but campaigning, there's a connection. In 2020, there is absolutely a connection. So I knew that guy was in trouble too. So um, very, very interesting. I want to swing around and talk about something specific that you've been working on that grabbed my interest on the County Board of Legislators, which is the voting machines issue. So I'll, oh, yeah. I'll tee it up, but I know that you can do much more with it. You recently, um, the Board of Legislators recently authorized a borrowing of $6 million to purchase a large number of new voting machines. And the, the concept is to fill a gap because you need a lot of voting machines to cover the bases, but there's inherent flaws in these devices. And you are among a cadre of legislators who raised their hands and said, wait, can we do this a different way? Tell me the rest of that story. Well, it, it goes back about two years on this, that, that um, the commissioners were, so, you know, very enthusiastic about these machines and hot to get them in. And it just struck me, you know, having been um, part, part of the scene, being involved as a district leader in, in democratic politics for 10 or 12 years, um, I was uh, a poll watcher, you know, one, not one of the official election inspectors, but a poll watcher for the party. You go to different uh, polling places to see how things are going, what the lines are like, what the machines are like. And I, I didn't think we had a real big, big problem with the machines. They were old and, and you know, some of them needed to be reconditioned. And sometimes, you know, there was an emergency, something had to be fixed. And now when you talk about and, the machines in that sense, you're talking about gigantic refrigerator size, Frankenstein style voting machines that had physical levers, right? No, 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 no. This is after that era. Okay. These are the, okay. you know, the ones where you, you fill out your ballot and you put it in a, in a scanner and Thank your you. ballot, you know, it's red. And Got then, it. but your ballot that you filled out by hand then drops to the bottom, which is a very important security feature because if there's any question or there's a recount, actually they do an audit of a certain percentage every year to see if um, the paper jibes with what the machines read, right? Um, and so they wanted to buy all these things. And, and first of all, I said, well, why? And why so many? And gee, they're very expensive. Not sort of not knowing about the technology issue, but having slowed it down a little by, by asking those questions, it turned out um, it was a very serious security flaw involved in, you know, I don't know how technical you want me to get on this, but it has, has I want to you to get technical. The fact that you I'm should never. I'm technical. The people that watch this are technical and I want you to get oh, okay. technical. Yes, I mean, go ahead. So, so here's the problem. You see, so when, um, so you, you would notice it if you did, because they had some of these machines um, for the last uh, primary, you know, they bought some in advance without our approval with some money they, you know, the board of elections had you know, sort of lying around and other money they'd gotten, uh, you know, that was COVID related that they, you know, decided to use on machines. Um, they have the capability, this one machine has the capability of printing the, well, okay. So, so when you go to one of these places now, uh, they don't, one of the early voting, they don't have the sheets that the chair out anymore that have the, the ballot. Mm -hmm. What happens is, uh, when you go to one of these central locations, your ballot might be different. What you're voting on is different maybe from the guy in the line behind you, right? So based on who you are and what district you're in, they then print out a ballot. Just for you. Right, just for you. You make sure, you know, it's, it, you know, you double check, I guess, to make sure it looks like you're supposed to be for the people you're voting for. You fill it out by hand. 
and then you feed it into this other machine, uh, you know, a scanner, and it drops to the bottom and you, and you have the paper. Okay, the problem is, uh, in order to uh, create something that is hard. Take your time. Oops, falling over. <laughs> no, it's the fun of live TV. No, because I've got another phone which only gets uh, prank calls and, and um, <laughs> you know, spam. It's a crank uh, phone. So you get a dynamically, so, so, you get so a dynam so, you so dynamically machine, generated ballot. Go ahead. And, and, and so in order to have a, a new machine that fulfills the requirement that you have um, compliance with the ADA for people with disabilities, um, this has, a, 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 it's built in the, the marking device, it's a hybrid. In other words, it, you, it both uh, can be a ballot marker and then immediately that piece of paper goes in and scan and goes down. The, pro the problem is um, it can be, the, the software can be hacked uh, so that it can be programmed to put an additional mark on the ballot after you have filled it out and put it through. Okay, time out for one second. Time out for one second, because yeah. I want to explain something here that maybe in a slightly different way than you just expressed yeah. it. You're talking about a multifunction device. This this Correct. voting machine is a multi, it's almost like a multifunction copier in the sense that like a copier can both copy and scan. Well, it turns out that this voting machine that they're recommending has a single paper path, and on Correct. that single paper path, the device is capable of inserting marks for one purpose, but it is also normally used for just being a scanner in which the ballot runs through the path, is scanned, tabulates the results, and shoots the ballot into some other location. You may know more about it. Take it from there and tell me why this is such a flaw. So it's still going to be, it's still going to go into that machine, right? And... The argument is, well, gee, anything, all voting machines can be hacked in some way or another. But because you're talking about your, your, your basic, remember, your basic auditing device, the most important thing is the piece of paper that the low tech part is, is the best part of security, right? That you filled out your ballot by hand. And if it goes through a, a you know, a, a single function scanner and it goes to the bottom, they can open that up and they can count count the as I say they, they take the sample or, mm. or if there's been some malfunction or something looks funny about uh, you know the, the totals involved they can take your actual pieces of paper out and start counting them mm -hmm. right yep but in this situation uh, it may not be auditable if uh, a program has mark put additional marks on that piece of paper that goes to the bottom of the machine and you know and their election law, uh, voting machine experts from, you, you know, you name it, Princeton, Georgia Tech, uh, I think Cal Berkeley, who have spoken quite a bit on this and are very active in trying to, to stop this because it can be, uh, you know, the program could be, wrote, be written sophisticated enough so that it, it puts an extra mark so that there's an right. overmark, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, an overvote, which cancels out the vote if it's not, if the, if the original vote was for somebody um, that you didn't want, or it seeks out, you know, a, a, a race that you didn't fill in the blank for, and it fills it in, you know, with your candidate. Right. Uh, I'm told it can be sophisticated enough so that it can spit out the right color ink, that right. it can mimic um, the kind of um, mark that you put. You know, some of us fill it in very carefully some spill over the little oval some don't fill in the whole oval right, right. understood so let me let me insert yeah. let me insert let me insert some um footnotes here um yeah. a, a voting machine is a computer right and computers run firmware and hardware and and software and one thing that i discovered in like doing a little homework for this segment is that um it is possible the, I'm, not, I'm not a cybersecurity expert. I know that it is possible for the firmware to be um, subverted, have different firmware inserted into that machine and cause it to do these other things. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is under normal operation, the firmware would prevent the marking of a ballot inappropriately. But if the firmware were somehow 
hacked or subverted or reinstalled uh, by somebody intending for the machine to work other than the way it normally is supposed to work, it could have all these other effects. And, and I would add one more to you. I've had my eye on this voting machine problem for a couple of years, and I saw this with my own eyes. So I saw a YouTube video a couple of years ago. So um, the data that these voting machines collect is stored on removable media. Everybody knows what removable media is. It's something that looks a little bit like this, right? You plug it in with USB, and it's got memory inside it. And they were using SD cards on this particular brand. And I'm not saying this was the brand of voting machine that we use in Westchester. It probably isn't. But I saw this demonstration, and it was compelling. An SD card was used to store the results data from the entire day's voting. And it was stored in what's called clear text. Clear text means uh, characters, numbers, and letters that you and I could normally read as opposed to machine characters or, or, or non-human readable format. So this, this, this data is stored on the SD card. So it was possible to remove the SD card, modify a text file that might say, you know, Mar 55 Stern 35, and somebody could change it and say Mar 55 Stern 65, I win the election, you lose the election. All they need to do is insert that chip, that little SD card, back into the machine. So the point is that machine they said was not hackable because that SD card was not accessible to users. But in reality, I walked into my own polling place and saw a machine where the SD card was totally accessible. Now, I'm going to yes. assume goodwill that the SD card on the machine that I was using does not contain machine readable data, that it would not be stored in a text file format, that it was not accessible, that it was encrypted, blah, 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 blah. There are lots of sharp edges on software and firmware that run these voting machines. It's a tremendous source of concern. Let me go back to County Board that's, of Legislators. Again, that's why we go back to the, the you know, the, the paper ballots. It, pretty much the, the pure touchscreen thing where there's no paper and you just do it as you you know, as you would do a uh, bank transaction, for example, and you can get a receipt or not get a receipt. But there's no hard copy of anything that you actually put your hands on. And that's that's the that's the way we can do the audit and, and see if um, there's something amiss with uh, how things are re recorded. Uh, electronically tell me where it landed though because i watched a video from i think it was must have been early 2019 where you had a presentation by the election commissioners and there was actually a product demonstration by the company that makes the machine and they were trying to tell you well you you have your choices were limited to one choice because there was only one voting machine at that moment of that decision that seemed to be certified to work in the state of new york how did that land, and do you find yourself in, frustrated by the situation of being presented with no options? Yeah, well, you, you know, the, the, the machines we have are still certified. And, uh, you know, they, they are still running. There were options involving uh, buying the, the printer, they're selling so you could, you could do the ballot printer for about four thousand dollars a piece you can do the straight scanner four thousand dollars a piece and um these hybrid machines were you know they were first presented to us at fourteen thousand uh a piece so do the math there you know and, and they still have them in stock somewhere and and um uh, interesting story is that nassau county we believe still has a whole bunch of these in stock that they used for for one year, 10 years ago, they used them one year, so they're certainly hardly used uh, before they changed over to another system mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And well, it was when they when they when they changed uh, um, parties party rule in Nassau County, which you know you wonder when when uh, a new vendor is brought in just because there's a new uh, <laughs> new party in control. But that sounds terrible. Uh, that sounds yeah, terrible, yeah. Damon. Well, the other t I mean, the other terrible thing is, you know, that, that that's a concern that people have raised a lot. Of course, is the, the, the fact that the two co-commissioners of the uh, Board of Elections are respectively the, the chair of the Westchester Democratic Party and the chair of the Westchester Republican Party. 
Um, is that going to change? With all that, is that going to change? I think so. Because uh, well, I, I think uh, I think there's a very good chance. Well, so they have a so they have a term that, that we elected them to a four year term. The current um, as as uh, commissioners of the board of elections. So their term goes out to 22 or 23. But we have a convention in the Democratic Party of all district leaders coming up next month. Uh, with regard to who's going to be the uh, uh, chair of Westchester Committee, and there's, I think, a good chance that it's going to be a different person. And uh, the people who are uh, challenging say that uh, the two jobs should be uh, separated, and that they're certainly not going to take them. They're not going to take the um, job of, uh, of uh, commissioner. And will that, know, will that, will and, that prospective... Um... The, only way they, the only way they can be yeah. removed at this point is, uh, you know, if the, if the governor um, finds, you know, that uh, things have gone so horribly wrong uh, with our elections. So that's a that's kind of a, a big story to bounce a county chair. Uh, are there the votes on the committee to do it? Uh, I haven't counted them all. There was, a, a, you know, an article today's uh, Journal News. You know, Mark Longariello does a good job of covering the Board of Legislators, so you can you can see it at the Journal News or lohud.com. Um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of support for um, the two other candidates. Is that there's a, there's another candidate I, I think does not have a lot of support, um, but you know, uh, unlike those primary elections. Um, the, the this this has this has runoffs you know it's like it's one of those convention things where you keep going until somebody gets a majority um on different ballots each mm -hmm. each ballot you know I, I believe you knock off the person who comes in last gets knocked off for the next round until uh you do enough rounds until somebody gets uh 50 plus one vote and um unlike the primary system yeah yeah <laughs> Which again, you know, technologically we could fix that too, right? With with preference voting, you rank rank order your preferences uh, to do an automatic. Uh, so really quick, would you fix it that way, or would you fix it with a runoff election? I think if we have the technology, you know, uh, a, a listing. Uh, I mean, people would have to learn how to do it, like like anything else. You know, it's going it to cause uh, a lot of questions and delays probably with people trying to figure out you know what they're doing and and it being explained to them right um well damon it's very interesting because you know i, I candidly growing up in westchester i never thought that much about county government you know i i, I went to saxon woods pool a couple times i went to the county parks from time to time i never really thought that much i thought maybe and then as when i became grow, grew up and i started paying taxes I complained about it like a lot of other people, and I thought, well, maybe this county government is, doesn't seem like a very important thing. But you know what? It runs the elections. It runs a health department, which is suddenly an extremely critical thing. Um, it used to run a hospital system. I guess don't do that anymore. Um, there's the county parks. There's a bunch of things there that really matter. So I, okay. I just want to thank you for everything you do on that board of legislators. So what I always tell people is when, when, when you flush the toilet, Think of county government, because that's a big part. Yeah. We're doing a lot of infrastructure work on uh, all the wastewater treatment plants, you know, because you don't want what you flush down the toilet to go straight into the uh, Long Island Sound or the Hudson River. And it goes to a county facility. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and uh, there's been a backlog of uh, work that needs to be done. Even as a layman, you can you know look at the pictures and see, man, that looks like something out of the 19th century quite yeah. often that, that we're looking at, and, and needs to be, uh, you know, modernized and and more energy efficient. You know, that's we look to that uh, all the time. It, it, there, you know, there's there's energy uh, to be saved and generated. Uh, you know, and anaerobic digesting of of uh, your waste and uh, you know just great stuff. Capstone question, do you think Westchester County government works well enough to run a school system? A school system, it would never happen. Everybody wants their own, you know, uh, same, same, same answer with police, for example. You know, Nassau County has one police force. It, you know, I, 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 people just historically, uh, you know, have their own way of uh, policing in, in their area and uh, the different school districts that's not to say there could be some you know sorts of shared services where you're saving money there, there's a you know like there's a, a consortium 
that involves uh, police, Nassau, Suffolk, and all the, the 43 different uh, police departments, I guess, in, in Westchester to buy police cars and, and other uh, equipment. And there's, you know, more room to do like back office stuff. And I think, you know, uh, maybe even, you know, this, this controversial pretrial discovery stuff um, on a more uh, centralized basis. But, um, you know, it, it's it's not realistic. Damon Moore, so, thank you for spending a little time with me today. Uh, I'd like to hear more from you, and I hope you'll come back and uh, be a friend of the show. Thanks again. Anytime. I, I like what you're doing. All righty then. Thanks, thank Damon. You. See you next time. Thank you. All Bye. right, that's it, folks. This is Red Blue Talk. Uh, tomorrow night, my guest is Asha Castleberry Hernandez. She ran for Congress in the 17th Congressional District recently, didn't make it, but we're going to talk to her about a whole variety of local and national issues. It's Charlie, on the, I'm Charlie, and this is Red Blue Talk, but this channel is all about how politics and government impact people's lives. Like, subscribe, you know what to do, and I'll see you tomorrow night at 7.30 instead of 7. Thanks, everybody.